Good evening, good morning, good day, whenever you are tuning in. This is Preston Smith with the three things brought to you by The Corners, www.thecorners.pl. And my name is Preston Smith, as you probably have guessed. And I am your risk intelligence consultant, detective, investigator, I hope, in Central Europe. You can check me out at www.cddipl. And yes, These introductions, huh? Uh, We are coming to you from MRP Studios in Praga, the Praga district in Warsaw, Poland. And we've got a lot to talk about today, a lot. We're not going to do the letters, though. We're not going to, I'm just going to save those up for the next time. I got a bunch of letters, yes, and I got some Bulgarian ones, I know. I'm not picking on Bulgaria. I'm not. Watch last week's uh, program, though, and you'll see why we talked about, look, Ruzha Ignatova, 5 billion euros. We're going to talk about things like that. Uh, But we did get some other letters which we will address in the next show because we got a lot to talk about this show. Uh, And let's go through these subjects. The first thing, uh, I'm interviewing uh, an outstanding uh, journalist editor. He's, He's been here forever. He worked for Bloomberg. He worked for Dow Jones. Uh, And he really knows his politics. And yes, we're going to talk about Polish politics. Politics in Poland. Why? Because we have elections coming up on October 15th. And these are seen not only by, you know, people like us in Poland, expats and Poles alike, uh, some of us who happen to be both. Um, and, and, but they are also seen as critical, critical, not only by us, but also by Europe and beyond, especially in the context of things like the war in Ukraine. That's the first thing. Uh, The second thing, uh, as you probably expect, um, is actually uh, the war in Ukraine. We're going to run through that, um, do our war in Ukrainian update. And then we have the third thing, which uh, is an interview with Jonathan Roy. Now, Jonathan Roy, you'd be like, well, who's Jonathan Roy? I know who John. It's a great name. It's the kind of name you think you must know. He must be like a you know, movie star, or famous, something like that. Uh, Jonathan Roy is a guy. He's an expat. He came to Warsaw seven, eight years ago. Uh, he'll tell us how many exactly. And he started a, a very popular restaurant uh, here that was in Warsaw. And then what happened? COVID happened. You're like, COVID? Let's not talk about COVID. Re- yeah, I do want to talk about COVID because COVID is in the news in the U.S. They're talking about masks again there, like the universities, but not only. They're, you know, I don't know. I can't believe it. They would talk, but maybe some sort of lockdowns or more vaccines or who knows what. Now, the fact is, in this part of the world, just like everybody, all of you, all of us, we all went through the bizarre COVID period where we watched tons of Netflix and uh, stayed at home. Some of us, like me, unfortunately, got very sick. But it did hit business owners. Uh, and man, it, it was tough for some of us. For some of us, it wasn't. Well, he's a guy uh, that it hit. And I want to get his perspective on just what that was like. Because, you know, um, kind of, you know, not, you know, you, you hate when people say man on the street, man on the street. But, you know, this was a guy who was actually really doing it, putting his blood, sweat, and tears into something. And then COVID hit and smacked him just like it smacked a lot of us. And I think that will be an interesting interview. But before we go further, before we go further, uh, last at Friday, which was September 1st, uh, the Christian Joy Foundation, uh, led by Henrik Pochadwi, had its, you know, it, it's, it's Bjurze, um, where basically they, they took supplies based on donations and Ukrainian drivers came up from Ukraine uh, they loaded it up into trucks, and uh, it was quite a sight. I, I went there. Um, I didn't actually do a lot of loading this time, to tell you the truth, because I kind of got, I kind of tweaked my back. Uh, I know that sounds lame, doesn't it? But I went there, participated in it again, saw it, interviewed Henrik uh, on site. You can so you can get a, a look at what was going on. Also, uh, Colin Tinsley, uh, head of the uh, of Hope and, uh, Hope for Youth Ministries out of Northern Ireland. They came all the way down from Northern Ireland. So have a quick look, a couple of quick interviews um, so you can see what's going on and because this is ongoing, ongoing. So take a look at this. Okay, guys, I'm here with, uh, this is Preston Smith. You guys know me. I'm here with Henrik Polchadwi. He's the director of the Christian Joy Foundation. 
Uh, and it's yet again, it's September 1st, and it's another food and supply drive to Ukraine. So, uh, Henrik, tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Well, this time we've invited 50 vans from Ukraine. They are all over here. <clears throat> we got two big trucks, 40-foot uh, trucks, full of uh, canned meat, 50 pallets, so that each van from Ukraine would get one pallet, which is 2,160 uh, tins, cans of uh, food, of meat. <clears throat> and on top of that, we have uh, four other big uh, trucks full of Nike stuff, new stuff, clothes, shoes, and everything. And there is more coming. So we are going to fill all those Ukrainian vats to the top. Thank you very much for all donations and all support. And so this is this is the uh, just the beginning of the day because it's about nine o'clock right now. How how long will this go on? Well, I think we'll <clears throat> take care of it within a few hours. By noon, we want to be done. We'll see yeah, how those it works. guys on the road, right? <laughs> right, right. Because they drove up from Ukraine again. These Some guys. from Kharkiv, which is uh, one thousand miles. Yeah. So. <clears throat> That's a Excuse thousand me. miles round trip. Yeah. Yeah. No, just one trip. Just one way. One, one way. Thousand, thousand miles. Thousand miles. Yeah. And so every van will get a gift certificate and ID number for the border so that there is no problem for them on the border. Right. And we are just here to help them. So thank right. you for being a part of it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. You're very Thanks, welcome. guys, for your support. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, this is Preston. I'm here with Colin Tinsley. Uh, you are the head of the Hope and Youth Foundation out of Northern Ireland, right? Yep, Hope for Youth Ministries, Northern Ireland. Sorry, Hope for Youth Ministries, my mistake. See, I'm kind of a crap journalist today, but oh well. Look, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. This is your, how many times have you been here? 80. 80? Yeah, it's 80, 80 80th time, zero. yeah. 80 times in yeah. Poland. Yeah. Right, and on these food runs, how many is this? Oh, this for Ukraine. We started off yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, March to last year. This will be the fifth one. The fifth one. Yeah. And so when you come down, you bring your whole team. Just every time it's a different team, all different right. volunteers. Never the same team. It's volunteers. For all volunteers, yeah. Right. So you come down and load up. You, but I noticed you guys keep tabs on everything. You, like, keep track of where everything's going. And yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And we, we also do a camp. Primarily, we come to do children's ministry. Right. Okay. So we come a little bit earlier, get involved with the food, help Henrik, try to raise some money to buy the food. Then we do a camp for the children. Right, and then some a camp for the children. But then some of you guys actually go into Ukraine, or at least I remember last time yeah. I went to. Yeah. If they're willing to, if they're, if they're married and their wives give them permission, that's fine. <laughs> My wife said no. Right, right. But right. some do go and they go to experience it, to see it. And other other happy to hear, do the job and let others sure. take it on, yeah. And so it's about, I guess it's about 9.15 or so. This is going to take a little while, huh, to load this yeah. stuff up. Yeah, we're here for a few days, so we're in no hurry. And, and the weather's beautiful. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's better than last time, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> last time was winter. But some of these guys have been driving for over a 1,000 miles. Yeah, yeah, that's and, what Eddie was saying. Yeah, just to just to get food, so it brings everything into perspective. Yeah, so so basically the goal is to get them loaded up and get them back on the road. Yeah, get them loaded up, get them on the road, get home, feed their right. people. All right, well, look, good on you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, guys, this guy is something else. Uh, I got to say, man, it's great to meet you. Okay? Yeah, you too. <laughs> right. Thank you. See you soon, buddy. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. All right, so you got to look, you, you got a glimpse, you got a glimpse of what it looked like on the ground. Uh, busy people uh, loading scores of, 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 of vans, kind of moving vans that came up from Ukraine. Some of these guys drove while you heard, you know, a thousand miles uh, hard trips. Now, my heart goes out to these people and also to the people in Ukraine that need these supplies. And guys, the reason I'm saying this is because I can, you know, I've been there. I've seen I've, on the ground. I see what these guys do. I know that they uh, still need donations. Uh, they, the, there, there were, you know, they've still got built. They bought the supplies, but I think there more donations are necessary to pay some of these bills. But even if they, they might have actually hit their goals, I got to talk to Henrik. I should, I'm being a terrible journalist. I didn't ask him. But even if they did hit their goals, this isn't the last time. We know that this war in Ukraine is going to continue and that there are going to be needs. And there's going to be yet another drive. Uh, the date is not yet set, but I'm going to put in the notes the information that you need if you do want to donate. 
Uh, and of course, when the next drive comes up, if you want to come down, help load, unload the trucks, load the vans, uh, get to know these guys, um, it is definitely worth it. Only good things to say about them. Now, let's get to the first thing with uh, our first guest, David McQuaid. Okay, the first thing, as promised, uh, we have a longtime veteran, uh, journalist, editor, this guy's seen it all, Dow Jones, Bloomberg. Uh, now you're freelance, uh, which there's, there's a lot to say about being freelance. I was also in the wire services and the wire <laughs> services wear you out, don't tell you, but. Oh yeah, you're, you're looking at another casualty of wire services. Yeah, terms. well, wire services wear you out. It's like, you know, how fast can I type all day long? all night long, you know, every day. But what I want to talk about, because David has seen it all, he's been here probably as long as I have, or longer. I've been here since since the early 90s. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so but then I was here also for a couple of years in the 80s. So you were I, here I might, before. The, yeah, yeah, before. Yeah. 80, 82, I was here. Wow, see, that's almost suspicious, isn't it? But the uh, 80, 82? You're not the only one who thinks that. No. <laughs> all right. What we want to talk about, though, uh, instead of the, the deep, dark past, and that is a long time back, that, mm. that really is. Uh, but what is coming up, uh, what lies in store for Poland? We have elections on October 15th. Uh, there are, I'm not the only one, inside Poland, outside Poland, a lot of people are looking at Poland and saying these elections are going to be key to how Poland moves forward, uh, in which direction in the near future. Now, to be fair, I think every single election Poland has ever had that that has been kind of the talk, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's always been, Poland seems to go from one kind of government to suddenly we have crisis and there's gonna be a huge change and very often there is a huge change. Uh, but this time around, um, the Law and Justice Party has uh, been in power for quite a long time. Uh, it hasn't necessarily made friends with the EU. It hasn't always been the most PR savvy, in my opinion, uh, abroad. Um, and there are a lot of criticisms that you could level at it, ranging from uh, allegedly stacking, I'm going to say allegedly because everybody's got an opinion on this, but stacking uh, the, the court system or changing the judicial system to my pet peeve, which was taxes. Um, um, there are quite a, quite a, there, there's a lot of emotion on this. And then also we get into the women's rights, abortion, et cetera, et cetera. But now the big question is whether or not the opposition actually has a chance and can win. And actually, Evgeny, Evgeny took my notes. I had notes here and they showed, yeah, Evgeny's a genius, but he took my notes. Uh, but the last poll that I saw um, actually put, oh, there you go. Magically, they came back. And the last poll I, that I saw actually put um, Law and Justice at uh, around 39% mm -hmm. support. Um, and if you take a look at KO, I always think just platform, it's hard for me just not to say platformer, right? right. But the coalition, um, uh, uh, the civic plat, you know, it's still the gist of it was civic platform. Now maybe our list, maybe we can have our watchers uh, agree that we will use uh, KO or platform interchangeably. I guess that's what that will have to agree, won't they? It's not mm -hmm. like you have a real time say. But if, if you take a look at that, now according to this, not to lie to you because I'm half blind, yeah, 30. 30% support. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we have uh, some parties that are, uh, that are, you know, have much less support, but there is kind of a surprise. And um, I guess if you're a libertarian, you might dig this, but some of the things they say are a little bit worrying. Confederatia, 11%. Mm -hmm. 11%. Right. 11%. And then we've got cookies at cookies uh, down at 1%, leave it at 9%. And that's kind of where we stand today. Now, before we get into it, because there's just even reading that, I can think of about a thousand questions that maybe they're all theoretical, but some of them are very pertinent, everything ranging from kind of the, the, the tendencies of, of the major parties to get closer and closer when it comes to the economy. Um, but then I'm not very happy with socialism in general. Uh, and then the Confederacia question, international question, et cetera. But what do you think? If you're just going to, off the top of your head, make a prediction, or can you make a prediction? What's gonna happen on October 15th? Uh, I think the most likely scenario is that we're gonna have hung, hung parliament. Hung parliament. Uh, that I think what's becoming increasingly obvious is that neither peace nor the combined opposition is going to be able to win an outright majority. I think that the combined, 
the polls are tricky, okay? And right. the polls are, always, are not always consistent. What I generally do is try and take the polls of polls, which is averaging out and right. looking at them over time. And what I think that you can see is that, is that and you can, you can see it going back in various elections, that Poland is more or less divided 50-50. Yeah, it kind of is. Uh, kind between of is. But those who are broadly speaking for the, quote, democratic, unquote, opposition, because obviously... Uh, Peace in particular and Confederate Nazi consider themselves as hi highly, if not more democratic than, uh, than the so-called democratic opposition. But if you look at, you know, you can, you can look at the Duda, Ch uh, Chaskowski uh, presidential election and so on. It's basically split right down the middle. Now, the, what we've seen recently over time in the polls is that Peace has certainly not been able to add to its electorate, and there are some indications, primarily because of Confederatia, uh, that peace's support is dropping as some people are moving away or either not going to vote or they're going to maybe switching but, their votes but to Confederatia. Is, is that actually draining peace, or is that just young people wanting, you know, that's less a good, gray that's haired a, That's people. a good point, but I, I, I think essentially, uh, uh, what happens, it, it, it amounts to the same thing, which mm -hmm. is the right of center, uh, more traditional or uh, uh, more kind of uh, national identity, national dignity, national sovereignty uh, voter, yeah. the young voter, yeah. um, now has a more attractive alternative to peace. Except Confederatia gets very, very, very like right wing. Mm -hmm. It's very right wing. I mean, this Confederates actually worries me uh, because I'm a little surprised that they have the support they have, although I'm not. And the reason I'm not surprised uh, goes back to, um, you know, the, the libertarian side of it that, you know, and, and it's funny, mm -hmm. but, you know, in a lot of countries like we we're back in the U.S. and you talk to young people, they tend to be in college. They're very democratic. Right. Which if you want to be a Republican, all oh, those guys are all, you know, Democrats are all socialists, whatever. Uh, in Poland, I don't really see a big difference now between the KO and the peace economic platform. It's all, it's pretty socialist now. I mean, they've moved closer together. If I were going to yeah. put it. Uh, uh, I, would, I would quibble, but okay. Well, we'll, we'll yeah, but, but you know, okay, fair enough. Well, we don't know because obviously platformer hasn't been in power for a long time. Right. But some of the things they right. say, for me, they sound like the, the, that they're getting closer together. The stuff that they're their... saying, I agree, because uh, that was a, uh, I mean, Tusk made a uh, uh, political decision uh, that the platformer was going to keep being rung like a bell as long as uh, the Polish electorate thought they would take away all the goodies that peace handed out. So yeah. Tusk made a cold-blooded political decision that he was going to swear left and right, that he wasn't going to take anything away. Wow, he's even going to add some new exactly. stuff. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's so, for but, me, that's, that yes. is... So, I mean, at that point, I don't quibble you, with you. I would argue that some other kind of underlying aspects of tax policy or asset sales or regulation of business and so on, that they might be more business and free market friendly. Well, well this is where I think Confederatsi maybe gets uh, some votes because I think as opposed, all Americans are going to get mad at me now, but young Americans, in my opinion, are not entrepreneurs until after, most of them until after they get out of university. Now, true, we got IT whizzes and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Where is in Poland, uh, young Poles, a lot of them want to start their own business, make some money. And that may be because it's so hard just to, when you're young here, to get a job and make any money. Um, mm -hmm. There's a long history with that. Uh, but they look at, you know, the tax. And I tell you, I look, you know, I, I, I was running a, 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 a Spulka Zo, a limited liability company. And I shut that down to run a, a, a just a sole proprietorship, run all my bit. And that was kind of against the grain when there were, you know, the, the tax system under law and justice, they literally tried to force people and they were pretty successful to shut down uh, sole proprietorships and start moving into limited liability companies. But if you've ever run a limited liability company here, it is a pain in the butt. The filing that you got your the, the you got the accounting costs, all the things that you have to do. Now, if you're a young person and you want to start a business, I think the last thing I could think of w that that would entice me to vote for a party would be that I, I really what I need to be doing is start a limited liability company right off 
when it's so hard to get money, it's so hard. To, and I think, but you know, beyond that, I think it's just out with the old, the old guys, out with peace, out with PO. Well, this is, and, this, this is essentially what I was going to say is that you've had in repeated elections, you've had uh, usually a new face and none of the above. I mean, when, when Cookies started eight years right. ago, Cookies was that way. a lot of votes like that. Uh, you know, before that, it was Janusz Palikot. <laughs> right. There was, I forgot Ro that. Robert Biedron <laughs> yeah, had a exactly. moment, ha had his had a moment. moment. A moment. Had a moment. Palikot had a longer moment. Right. Uh, yeah. Actually, go thinking, you know, more on that side, uh, thinking about... Uh, 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 Confederatia, Corvin Mika, who is now part of Confederatia, had more than a moment. I yeah. mean, he was a, there was, there was actually the old saying is that the, a traditional stage of Polish manhood, at least university educated manhood, is to go through a raging uh, Corvin Mika phase. <laughs> He's going to get you know? me sued. I'm not going to say another word. No, I, don't, okay. I don't hear that. I'm not saying another word. Uh, He's going usually, to be usually, the, If Kormika wants to come on the show, you can come on the, the show. The, don't the, you the, 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 folklore, the folklore was that usually around the age of 30, uh, guys generally grew out of their Kormika phases. But, but in I'm any not case, saying yeah. this. I'm not the one saying this. But there's Actually, a, there's a, there's a long, know. but there's a long, all I'm saying is there's a long tradition in Poland, in modern Poland, of these parties the jump right. of being an alternative to the established parties, which everybody's sick of. And right, right now, at least this year, it's Confederatia's turn. And for those of you who don't know, I'm sure tons of you who are watching don't know who Korwin Meek is. If you're not in Poland, everyone in Poland does know who mm -hmm. Korwin Meek is. And um, let's just say he's quite outspoken. Uh, and he, uh, but when it comes to say libertarian policies, yeah, I guess he fits. He fits right in. And so. and to be fair, he's been consistent yeah. about he has this been. since the 1980s. He is. He has the been the period. most consistent libertarian in Poland for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, no doubt about that. But to bring it back home to to something that our foreign viewers are going to uh, going to follow, um, that when it comes to the elections. 50-50, I agree, except that Poland has been notoriously uh, extreme when it comes to voting. And a good example is why Civic Platform, or now it's KO, uh, is not in power. Because prior to, you know, they were in power for, what was it, eight years? So how many yes, years? Eight, yeah, eight, eight years. Eight, eight. They were in power for eight years. And uh, to, uh, you know, th there were scandals, there were corruption scandals, there was a tape scandal. Um, but I had the feeling that the Polish press was blindsided by how they were, you know, pretty much wiped out in the elections and they lost their hold on power. Um, prior... Well, the shocker, the shocker yeah. really was the, 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 what started the avalanche was the presidential election. Yeah, the because all of yeah. the Because all of the polls uh, consistently... Uh, showed Komorowski ahead by a very substantial margin. Now, admittedly, to defend the polls for a second, the polls did show as the election grew closer. He means closer, the polls, not the polls. The, yes, the surveys, the voter <laughs> the surveys. surveys yeah. As we got closer to the election, uh, showed the movement was towards Duda. Okay, yeah. so they picked that up. But the fact of the matter is, in the last month of the election, um, Komorowski went from being something like twenty points ahead yeah. to losing. Yeah. And that shows you, of course, there are some issues with methodology, some of which uh, uh, the professionals have tried to address. Pol Pol Polish surveys, voter surveys, have had issues for years and years now. I think they're well, it, better it, now. All around the world. Yeah. I mean, it's not just... Yeah. And I guess what I'm trying to get at is, one, yes, there uh, some past elections have shown that there can be substantial movement, well, uh, even though... It, the appearance is that the pol electorate is so polarized that what we're doing is we're, we're fi they're fighting over you know the undecideds, yeah, but the decideds you know they're not going to yeah. change. But the fact of the matter is we've seen Polish recent Polish elections where there's been substantial movement in the month before the election. Absolutely. Uh, oftentimes, usually, I, I'm sure, mainly by people who were not ordinary voters. But then, well, I almost can't think of an election. I mean, literally every time we've come down to a, a point like this, we have seen a sea change. I mean, if we, if we go back, before Platforma, we had the first uh, piece. Before Peace, well, then we had SLD. Yeah, and the, sec the second you know. point I just want to make, which I think is really important, is that uh, the overall level of trust in society, not just here, but obviously worldwide, has declined. And right. what that means is that the polls, by their very nature, the surveys are less reliable right. because people are not, a large chunk of people are refusing to either to take part 
and uh, maybe a smaller group of people are not being completely frank about their political preferences with and, the, and then there's a uh, if you ask me uh, a sizable group of people that's growing all the time that just doesn't read right i mean that is just voting on based on Facebook posts or, or just a post that comes across. And then I'll introduce another a final element of uncertainty. If we're talking about the polls and the election and how this is uh, stacking up 50-50, the problem about calling this election is the fact that, okay, if society is divided 50-50, but the political scene is not divided 50-50. Right. right. You've, got, you've, got, you've got on the right-hand side, right side, you've got two large groups if you stick confederacy there, although I'm not saying that a coalition with peace is inevitable, but I'm just saying they're on the right side of the, the, the spectrum. Well, if you look at what Confederati says, it doesn't look like it would work. Right, and then, yeah. and then but on the other because, side- Because they're libertarians. You've I mean, got the really opposition yeah. divided by three, and then you also have the added complication as one of the key element of the opposition, which if they, uh, which if they don't get into parliament, the opposition loses, then if, if and that is the so-called third way, the PSL. Right, right. And, and because they're a coalition, they have to get an 8%, they don't, not the 5%, they have to get 8% of the vote to get into parliament. Right. Um, they're polling a little bit, generally a little bit above that, but it's not comfortable. If they don't get in, in terms of the opposition forming government, it's game over. Right. Oh, that's uh, a good point. And, and, that's a good point. And that's what it's makes it- It's easy to assume that they're going to get in and we're going to come down this and it, right. it, I think they probably will, but I can easy, it's very plausible they won't. Uh -huh. and, and if they don't, and this is in fact one of the reasons why I think peace is trying to polarize to get people to say it only makes sense to vote for a big party. Right. That's the real, because, because essentially if they, right. can, if they can drive uh, those two parties below that coalition, below the 8% threshold, they win the election. Right. Maybe, uh, e maybe even a majority without Confederacia. Yeah, that is if, that if is things a good break, point. If things break exactly right. Well, let's, let's flip it around. Last, last uh, kind of let's call it discussion uh, topic when it comes to the elections. And, but we, this has to do with Ukraine mm -hmm. because we are seeing now suddenly at not a good time for peace, uh, dissatisfaction uh, from the farming community here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons it is indirectly uh, the support of Ukraine, which goes back to everything, the grain deal to farm products coming out of Ukraine to, to, the, to the Polish farmers feeling that this isn't fair. Uh, we have seen very heavy support, which I'm not knocking, uh, especially from Morawiecki, who was saying we've got to support Ukraine. He was harassing the Germans, which peace doesn't mind doing that. Uh, and rightfully, and uh, a lot, and a lot, and of the us, Germans a lot of us to like be harassed. To it, yeah, you know? the Germans deserve to be harassed when it came to uh, supporting mm -hmm. the Ukrainians, not mm -hmm. being, you know, you know, with a waffle on that. Um, however, now. That support, uh, plus maybe a little bit of fatigue when it comes to dealing with refugees, um, which is, I, I think, I still don't really see it because I think the polls are still very, very tolerant and very like welcoming. But you know, you are going to have it's some inevitable. Of that. It's inevitable. It's yeah. human nature. Yeah. But then you get into we we even had the situation we talked about uh, a week or two uh, ago when you had the diplomats calling each other on the carpet over yeah in mm -hmm. the in the polls mm -hmm. and the Ukrainians not getting mm -hmm. along and this. Is this a danger for peace? Could this suddenly um, really shock them when it comes to just their, it's not quite a traditional community either, because that's the other thing. People say, oh, the farmer's always with peace. Ah, wait, wait, wait. Leper was the farmers that got with peace yeah. way back. We go back in history. It became kind of that. There, yeah. I mean, yeah, there are all kinds of ins and outs there. That's yeah. true. It's a, it, uh, they, it's a base, they can't take it for granted. I mean, if if peace loses the the rural vote, I mean, because right. the rural vote is not the farm vote. I mean, well, mainly, true. mainly only about true, five, true, true. Uh, only true. about five percent of people who live in rural areas actually farm or right. farm for a living. Right. Uh, but they make a lot of noise and but represent they are, those communities. Right? They, so, they yeah. are very uh, uh, they are opinion shapers within their communities. So yes, yeah. they they their their voices are important. I I think it comes down to this: peace has has got a tough. Uh, road to hoe on this because they yes they want to support Ukraine yeah. and I think that that support it, for the most part is is genuine and sincere. However, they they can't afford to lose the farm vote. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the third thing I'd said is that they for corruption or or simple incompetence um, neglected the issue of of Ukraine Ukrainian 
grain exports leaking out into the Polish market. Right, right. Um, which they could have controlled and failed to control. I think that's tough for, I, I think we, we got to give them a little bit of a uh, benefit of a doubt that that's tough to control. I well, mean, they, you have a wartime and you've got grain, you can't keep well, track they of would, it. Well, they would have had to um, spend serious money essentially doing what they ended up trying to do, which create these sealed transports yeah. that are monitored. And it means hiring staff. It would have meant oh, hiring a, a few thousand. That's a big job. It, yeah, but it would have meant sp spending uh, tens or hundreds of millions of zloty. But, you know, they spent tens of millions well, of hundreds of millions of zloty they, on other stuff. They, but do they have it for that kind of thing? I mean, to be, to be the devil's advocate there, because I've dealt with just as a detective, uh, that carousel and all that. What mm -hmm. you want to do, if you want to flip products, you want something that you can't put a stamp on. Grain is great. Perfect. In fact, grain is great for put drugs in grain. You can flip grain a hundred times. It's like paper. Paper products yeah. are great. No, so, I, I, mean, it's a, I see into your regular job. experience, yeah. but the, uh, your 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 superior experience. But I would just say that there were was no sign. I heard from multiple sources uh, that 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 peace even considered this they to be an issue a year ago. Through, yeah. In fact, uh, th there were comments, I think public comments from Kaczynski, who is obviously no uh, farm expert anyway, right. uh, over a year ago in which he simply was dismissive about it and saying this, that, is, this is not gonna be a yeah. problem. And that, that's a good one. You know what, but there's one more point I'm gonna sneak in there, uh -huh. sneak in before you, because the other, and I don't wanna just, you know, I have to have you back for another show because I'm, I'm picking on peace, but I could turn this around and just, uh, mm -hmm. The, and pick on uh, on uh, on platforma too, but one other issue, migration. Now, oh yeah, that yeah. is an issue that is uh, we have an much, hour? it's become yeah. Do we have an hour? It's much more of a hot potato for peace than I think peace assumed it would be, because they wanted to sit there and say, okay, Tusk is for migration, and everyone, no one wants. Well, that migration. was Tusk, that was Tusk's master stroke, which is that I don't know how he. Uh, I mean, apparently this is publicly available information, but for whatever, uh, uh, most of us in the, in the journalistic profession were sleeping on it. Yeah. But the, the, the Poland is dealing demographically with a labor shortage, increasingly severe labor shortage. And as it turns out, the foreign ministry had been working for more than a year yeah. on a proposal to accelerate the granting of work visas, which <laughs> yeah. as it turns out, they were targeting- Under peace, yeah. They were targeting countries in the Middle East and South Asia, exactly. basically being able to mass import Gastarbeiter, yeah. um, you know, in their tens and hundreds of thousands. They were, the, the talk was that they were gonna outsource uh, fast tracking 400,000 work visas a year. And uh, unfortunately for, for peace, uh, Tusk, somebody alerted him yeah. to this fact, and he was able to turn the tables. But then there's another yeah. issue there that, it, that uh, trying, trying to scaremonger, and if we're going to say that's what that was, that kind of, it, you know, yes and no. I'm not going to be completely, uh, because actually when my opinion, I tend to be actually tougher on migration than a lot of people in the sense that I understand, look, I came to this region where I had 800 bucks. It's hard to move. It's hard to get ready to get Preston, registered. we're both, we're both immigrants. Yeah, we're immigrants. You know, yeah. I and I do think you got to vet immigrants. They've got to go through the process. I am for that. I'm, I am not for uh, when Angela Merkel sort of like, hey, just everybody come in. I think that was a huge mistake. So clear on that. I don't want anybody to think I'm not. You'll say, oh, you're from Texas. You hate. No, no, that's no, not no. it at all. That's not it at all. But... It turns out that the EU was going to basically give Poland exceptions anyway because all the yeah. Ukrainians here. So this became a real strange situation for uh, peace because they 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 wanted to show their electorate that they don't want migrants, but then they were already doing this <laughs> these visas. Well, it's then, all all yeah. fair, all fair and love and war. Obviously, from Tusk's point of view, raising this. From my point of view, as let's say a, a, an economic, a business journalist or a, or a political analyst was pure demagoguery in the sense that Poland needs to import labor. Yeah, but Tusk kind, of put it, Tusk kind of put his foot in it too, though. Because the way, when Tusk came out, the way he looked as if he was going to play himself off as being, as being the, the candidate that is going to limit immigration. That is kind of how he came out and said it. If you, you know, I remember, yeah, but I did watch and listen to the podcast very right. carefully. And, right. and actually, the podcast itself, his comments were nuanced. 
Okay. We're, we're nuanced. We're nuanced. No, he said what? Because I just yeah, read, no, it, no, I just no. read them. It was mo- like, more nuanced. He said, I was like, man, all these guys. It's no. like Confederates is not going to know who to pick. Specifically said, I am not an enemy of migration, right. immigration. I right. simply think it needs to be controlled. Right. And that the government has to know what's going on and right. that this is uncontrolled. But the, the, nevertheless... Tusk knew what the headline would be. Yeah, he did. And the headline would be anti-immigration. Which is kind of amazing. Which is sort of what he wanted. And it's one of the few times that we have seen uh, Tusk, and I'm not trying to say Tusk is stupid or anything, but it's one of the few times that we've seen Tusk outmaneuver Kaczynski on a topic that can be key for elections. Because you got to give credit to Kaczynski. That guy, he thinks everything through. It's always Mm -hmm. ticking. He seems to always have five plays, uh, even with his own party, controlling his own mm-hmm. party. Uh, but this time, actually, Tusk, actually, he, he knew what he was doing or he had He knew what he was doing, or, but I, I yeah. also wonder, again, getting back to the big question, which maybe our, some of our readers uh, want to know. I mean, we journalists, people who follow uh, uh, politics day to day, uh, can get all excited about this, like, you know, brilliant chess move well, right. type thing where right. you know, he scored some points. I'm not certain it's going to affect the vote one way or another in any significant way. Well, you know way. what you said it because actually I saw a poll uh, where it didn't. It, it this whole all of this talk about the the uh, when it comes to uh, migration or immigration in this, it didn't seem to budge anyone into its direction from mm-hmm. I, any side. You know that because as we know, even within. Uh, KO, there's resistance to Tusk. There's, but remember yeah. that a lot of what's going on here, it's not even so much about bringing voters from the other side into right. your side. It's about demobilizing yeah, true. the other side. True. In other words, a lot of what Tusk is doing is simply uh, is simply trying to persuade some people who might have voted for peace to say, I, you know, because they might not like certain things peace is doing, they're just like, oh, don't bother. I'm not going right. to vote because whatever turns out that the other side isn't that much different anyway. And, and obviously, Peace is doing the same thing, trying to demobilize yeah. Yeah. Uh, Platforma's electorate in yeah. exactly the same way, saying, you know, it doesn't matter, you're going to lose, so I think why go to the... when you see the major parties working to demobilize the other side instead of just to work on getting out the vote, you're, you're looking at trouble. I mean, if we just look at historical elections, when you focus, I mean, everything from ne- negative ad campaigns, I'm going back to the U.S. too, negative ad campaigns hit the other side, but they don't get out the vote in your own party. They tend to make guys say, yeah, I never liked those guys. But it doesn't make somebody say, yeah, I want to join and be a, make a positive, you know. You will have people that will vote, but they're already going to vote. People I would, that like I those would ads make, are already going to vote. You'll probably light into me for this. Yeah. But I would make a little bit of an analogy with the situation in the U.S. And I would say that that peace, like the Republican Party, is yeah. more interested in limiting the franchise because they are long-term pessimists about, about the, the demographic and cultural forces that are moving against them. Um, the only, okay, I actually don't disagree with you as much as you might think. Now we're really going to open a can of worms. Huh? Wait till, I'm, I'm not reading the You're letters. I, I said I'm not going to, no, right, no, okay. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> okay. I did, I, I, he, I'm not reading the letters this week. You don't know oh, that yet, okay. but I'm not because it's like everybody hates Preston right now. But anyway, no, but what I would say, what I would say is that the Republican Party, and, and if you take a look at what the different leaders said, uh, Lena, they, I don't believe they want Trump. I think this is another, one more time that Trump has become a bigger machine. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Than, so it's a little bit. But what they want doesn't yeah. matter now. Well, that. <laughs> That is the point. For that matter, for that matter, I I didn't say what the Republicans want. Doesn't matter. I didn't say that. Don't write me that. But lately, I don't even know whether Mitch McConnell knows anymore. No, well, he's yeah. I think he's done. Yeah, I think he's he's off to retirement or something. He's he um, he's had a long career and and. you know, I kind of, I'm actually not going to say it, man. I'm going to get okay. all kinds of Sorry. email on this one. That's all right. That's all right. One day we'll just do an American politics one. Maybe we'll do that in Polish, though. <laughs> okay. Not do that in English. There's okay. only so, many, so much mail I can take. Because I, I was going to actually do the letters this, this week, and then I realized that I, it would take, like, the whole show. 
and it was all it was pretty man i got blasted I'm well, so I, would, I would i would guess this is on we, bulgaria i would guess that at least i got some 70 percent i'm of, picking on bulgaria 70 percent of our viewers probably uh probably follow american politics more closely than i do you know um i i got to where i kind of stopped I agree. I kind of stopped. And there's so much going on right now in the region and in Poland that mm -hmm. uh, there's enough to follow. But yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to we're going to bow out now and not right. go down the road of American politics. Next thing I'd have right. to address these letters on Bulgaria that I got. Don't go there. Uh, no, don't I don't want to go there yet. But I, I'll do those next week. We'll talk about those next week. But anyway, look, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, Always a pleasure. You know, we're going to we're going to get David back pretty soon. And he actually wrote in the magazine. You can find what he wrote. Uh, if you get the hard copy or if you just get on the site and have a look. Um, but in a few weeks, we're going to go back to this. I, because I've got lots be... of good stuff on the southern front in Ukraine. I'm eager to share. Yeah, so we, we'll didn't, that we didn't talk about it. We'll have to do that, too. Uh, and that brings us to a good point, To The next thing, the second thing, uh, I'm going to run through the Ukrainian battlefield report. There's a lot happening, um, a lot of discussion from the Russian bloggers, the Ukrainian bloggers, the Americans, all, and I don't agree with any of them, as you probably realize that I never, ever do. Uh, but we're going to run through the Ukrainian report for the second thing, and then we've still got the third thing to come, so stick with us. And thanks again. Pleasure. <laughs> now for the second thing, uh, the Ukrainian battlefield report, the Ukrainian war report. Okay, guys, uh, first, apologies. Um, what I have been doing is, I even said I was going to do it this week. Uh, on Thursdays, I usually put up uh, an update. Uh, actually, uh, I couldn't do it this week because I got a little bit of food poisoning. I didn't feel very good, got behind on everything. But what I'm going to start doing probably, because we're starting to run up on the next magazine, got to get to that together, probably we will just do these from now on uh, in the vlogs. For them in, until we get through the next magazine, get it out. Um, but it didn't hurt that we waited anyway. Uh, there, there, there was a lot. Uh, there has been a lot going on, and there were many news reports from the West, especially that talked about breakthroughs. That talked about you know you reading like oh you Ukrainians have broken through. The war is going to be over in a few days. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's try to have a sober look at all this stuff. And, and it's kind of, I think it's kind of good that I didn't put out uh, an update earlier this week just so we could see how things played out. But a lot of things went on that are worth talking about. Now, first, a bit of a catch up before we get into the actual battlefield report. A bit of a catch up. Some of you may have heard about these Ukrainian drones uh, that went all the way up to uh, and hit a Russian base, Peskov, up all the way by Estonia, Latvia, the Baltics. And you're like, and, you know, this is a long way. It's like 700 kilometers. Uh, how do they get the drones up there, et cetera? That's a very interesting story. And we could do a whole segment on that, to tell you the truth. What it looks like now, however, is that it wasn't, you know, when it first happened, two Russian uh, military transport planes were hit. Then four then it became maybe six. Now maybe, you know, they're even saying maybe up to nine were hit. Uh, these air, the, the, you know, these are key aircraft. These, these, uh, these, these LL 76 cargo uh, planes. The reason why they're so key is because they actually can move around things like tanks, troop carriers, etc. So this was not a small thing. But you know, again, you get into the kind of the there's propaganda value and there's also the shock value. As we know, the Ukrainians have been using drones, you know, all the way to Moscow. But this was really something because they were so accurate and they, it was so far away and they actually managed to hit these planes. Now, the first conclusion was they came out of Ukraine and the Ukrainians have some phenomenal technology. Then you start hearing things about cardboard drones, cheap drones, etc. But then a funny thing happened. And uh, first, the Ukrainian SBU, they sort of implied this, and they kind of said it. it's true that the drones actually were launched from within Russia itself. Now, whether or not this is true, I have no idea, but you can imagine that this has propaganda value in and of itself. So that is something to watch, as are, you know, the, the drone wars just keep increasing. Uh, the sea drone wars, uh, actually, just yesterday, there was another... Um, attack near the Kerch Bridge. This was actually uh, going for Russian vessels. But this is nonstop, and it's having a greater and greater impact, although the impact has been tremendous on the battlefield for some time. But now let's get into 
the actual battlefield report. And I'm going to revert you to the maps. And, you know, usually I start up at Kupiansk. This time, I think we're going to start at Roboknya because that's where a lot of the news was coming from. And the news was basically that the Ukrainians have a big breakthrough. They've driven, you know, they were, they were, they were talking about six kilometer drives and nine kilometer drives. Uh, maybe that's it. I even saw press reports that, oh, in a few days, the big breakthrough, Russia is going to fall apart. Well, I would like to believe that, but I, again, I say let's take a conservative, let's you know, look at this and see what is really happening. Now, it is true that it does look like there was, there has been a breakthrough, and the breakthrough is significant in the sense that there seems to be no doubt that Robotnia is actually controlled by the Ukrainians at this point. It, there seems to be no doubt that they're pushing hard uh, for Novo, uh, Novo uh, Pro, Prokopivka, Boy, that's always a tongue twister for me. And it seems like they're actually driving uh, hard um, to the to to the east of Novo uh, Novo Prokopivka. Still a tongue twister for me. And you know the 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 plan here, the long you know the bigger plan here may be to drive and then to angle and go for Tokmak. That we've talked about that in the past. There is another simultaneous drive uh, towards Verbove. And uh, that appears to be just to the just to the um, west of Rebolve. There's a lot going on there, and the talk is that the Ukrainians um, are are gradually making significant headway there. And then we're going to talk about the tanks rolling in that they've assembled, uh, and then maybe we get this um, this this big drive that we we're talking about. There there are some problems with that though. When you see the reporting that they busted through the line, because they're talking about the Sorovikin line, which obviously uh, the, the, the Russian defenses, you know, are famous for having been de designed by the General Sorovikin, who wound up thrown in jail, and we haven't really heard from him since the whole Prigorzhin debacle. But there's not just one line. That they've broken through one line is very, very possible. You can't see it on the map, but there are a couple more lines to go. And it, it's actually complicated. I'll try to put put the uh, you put down the lines so that you can see them maybe in the next go round, so you get a better idea of what that looks like. But we're hearing and reading accounts of yes, more mines, and they're not now. They're talking about four to five mines a square meter, and the Russians using possibly some sort of napalm. Uh, to set the minefields on fire to try to slow down any kind of demining activities. Um, it does not look like this is now a breakthrough in a, a walkover, although, although there are plenty of reports that indicate that the Russians that are on the defense have been worn out. They're, they're having a terrible time with the Ukrainian pressure. Uh, but if you take a look at what's going on, there, there's another, a whole nother, another a dynamic at play. And that is basically that the Russians have taken some of their best, their, their most war-hardened, combat-hardened uh, seasoned soldiers, they've taken them out of that Kupiansk offensive, which we'll talk about, and they've brought them all the way down here to bolster the defenses. Now, whether or not they could get them down there and get them uh, in, into a, a position where they could actually make a difference and stop the Ukrainians cold, which is obviously what the Russian goal is going to be, or whether or not they're going to be thrown haphazard into this battle is very, very difficult. But we're talking about the Russian 41st from Kupiansk, and uh, basically you bring an entire army all the way down uh, from, from that front, all the way down to Robotnya, then that does show some signs of desperation, which makes you believe that, yeah, the Ukrainians are doing quite well. Um, this is going to be the battle to watch, and this may be actually the key battle uh, because there, we'll see what happens with the weather, but time is of the essence. Uh, if the weather goes bad, then everything grinds to a stop, and this is kind of the window of opportunity possibly for the Ukrainians. Now, again, there's a lot of excitement about this, um, but I don't think anybody should underestimate the toll uh, in, in just the, the, you know, the casualty, we're hearing about high casualties. We just are. I don't think we can play that down. The Ukrainians are paying this literally, um, you know, it's a blood and guts campaign. It is what it is, and we will see what happens. Now, if we actually move, I think actually traditionally what I did is I went from Kupiansk down to the south. Now I'm going from the south up to 
the north. Now, if we go, if we go up to the to, if you know, kind of follow the map, and I'm actually going to skip. I'm going to skip a few uh, locations um, just because I don't see that there's a whole lot of movement there. But we've talked a lot about Stadmajorski. Stadmajorski. There was oh, only a week or a week and a half ago. There were plenty of headlines talking about the huge Ukrainian success in taking uh, the settlement of Urozhaina. You can see that on the map. Um, that appears to that that appears to slow down because the 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 Russians put up quite a fight. Although there is again there are reports of movement there. And interesting enough, it looks like the Ukrainians have driven straight south and actually hit Zavitny Bajana, and they've actually made it there now. What happens at that point is difficult to know. We talked about what was going to be key, that the Ukrainians on, would actually widen their control to the west of Staromorsky. We talked about that and also in Prutnia. We know that they're pushing in Prutnia, but, but it looks as if the Russians have moved parallel down towards Z Zavitny Bajani, and they've been shelling and trying to slow the Ukrainians down. Now, I was very high on this offensive, but the thing is, it looks like it may have slowed down, and it may have slowed down for reasons that could be similar. This is a little bit of theory here. It could be similar to what we saw with the Russians taking uh, their best guys and bring them down to stop Robotnia, the, the Ukrainian Robotnia offensive. It may be that the Ukrainians have taken some of their uh, their, their toughest, uh, most battle-hardened uh, vets and taken them up to Kupians to stop the Russian offensive there. So this is, this is actually kind of interesting that both sides are adjusting and there's real distance involved here in logistics to get this done. Now, I'm much less sure about what the Ukrainians are doing, uh, paradoxically, than what I am when it comes to what the Russians having moved uh, their 41st from Kupians. But there we go. Um, let's move on. Go up quickly to Bakhmut. Uh, Bakhmut is interesting because the Ukrainians had made a uh, they'd made progress in, in Kashevka, uh, taken probably two thirds even of Kashevka. That was that was the story. We know the Ukrainians have been actually uh, also targeting Andrivka, and but they but they've they've really been putting pressure on the Russians there. We're not necessarily hearing that they made. Uh, a, t a lot more progress since the last time that uh, that we spoke, um, but they're they're also putting pressure on north of Bakhmut in the direction of Yahidni. There's not a whole lot more for me to say there. The only thing that uh, I can say is that the Russians are trying to react hard um, in, with artillery drones, which is kind of in some way the same old story uh, that we've heard or that we've heard recently. Uh, around the Bakhmut area. Now, let's get, this is where things are getting a little bit more interesting. Let's move up towards the Svatovi front. Way back weeks ago when we started this podcast and we talked about this Russian buildup of 100,000 uh, in Svatovi, maybe another 100,000 up in Kupiansk or 100,000 altogether, it was very hard to say. Uh, I talked about the Russians wanting to push across uh, from, say, if you're taking a look at this map, you can see the arrows. Um, uh, if you look at uh, Rajhorodka or uh, Jer 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 Jerelny, uh, from that area, or Andrivka, push across and target Borova. You can see Borova out there. And then this offensive just sort of stopped, burned out, didn't go anywhere. It looks as if at uh, Nove Horivka, and you see where those arrows are, it looks as if the Russians are starting again, and they're starting that. Now, we know they're being met by fierce uh, Ukrainian resistance. Um, but again, that buildup, you know, the Russians at one point launched. They said, here comes our offensive. And then it, it sort of started, and then it kind of petered out, especially in Svatovay. But it looks like maybe they're starting, starting up again. That is not the most interesting thing, though. What is interesting is if we go up further, and now we up, we're back at Kupiansk. Now, Kupiansk has been on our radar now for some time. And as you well know, I've been quite worried about it. The Russians are definitely, they haven't dropped the ball, but as I said in the last vlog, it seemed as if they'd it, it just sort of run out of gas. Uh, and, I, and I pointed out that it seemed like after seven or 10 days, the Russian offensives tend to run out of gas. 
This can be because of logistics, because of the ability of the Ukrainians to be very, very flexible. But a couple of things have happened uh, that have get, got me, have kept me worried about Kupiansk. Um, and I think we need to keep this in mind. And when, and when you see statements uh, from the Ukrainian side rebutting criticisms from the, uh, from the West saying the Ukrainians need to focus more on one place and try to break through, but the Ukraine saying, look, we can't, we have to be ready for what's happening uh, in the North where the, where the Russians, I mean, actually, uh, Zelensky said the Russians have 200,000 up there. And I, I believe he's counting uh, Svatovy and all the way up to near Kupiansk. Uh, but he said, this is, this is a, a worry. It's a, it's a problem. We have to react to it. And we, have, we know we have had seen fierce fighting. The Russians driving down out of Liman Pashi and trying to take Sinkivka, but then not being able to take it. They still haven't taken it as far as we know. Um, driving in the general direction of Petro Pavlivka, hitting bridges uh, in that area. And uh, what's interesting, though, I'm a little bit more optimistic now, at least for the moment, that the Russians were not going to make progress, that Ukraine is going to keep holding them up, because as we mentioned, uh, because of the pressures in Robotnia, the Russians took their, their most battle-hardened uh, combat troops in that area, the 41st, and took them all the way down to Robotnia. And now it appears that the 25th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade, you can see it on the map, uh, are the, they have the task of trying to drive out the Ukrainians. And from what we understand, they're not very well trained. Uh, they have had very little training. They're definitely not battle hardened. Uh, the Ukrainians so far are not impressed. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, and uh, there, there's talk of a, another Russian mobilization. There may be more pressure, but for the moment, um, probably with the outfit that the Russians have right now, it's going to be very difficult for, them, difficult for them to make a lot of progress. But is this still a concern? Yeah, it's still a concern. Uh, do I expect a huge breakthrough in the next few days that changes the entire war, and we see down in Robotnia or Staromayorska especially, uh, huge, uh, you know, a quick drive of, you know, 20, 30 kilometers um, that, that changes everything. I don't expect it. Um, I think that we have to be realistic here. Uh, the Ukrainians really are, are battling for every inch and they are making progress. We have to commend them for that. They may get a breakthrough. Um, on the other hand, let's, you know, let, let's see what happens over the next few days. Uh, keep rooting. And, you know, to tell you the truth, once again, just to end this part of the, of, of the vlog, I don't understand the logic of what is happening now on the part of Russia. I don't understand it's, you know, the bloodletting, the pressure that, you know, that what's happened to their economy, uh, what the ultimate goal is just to, just to cause damage in Ukraine to subjugate Crimea, which doesn't have enough water, which now, you know, the, if you lay mines everywhere, if you, if you take this kind of damage, you deal out this kind of damage, I don't see how anyone wins. And, I'm, and I have to wonder, you know, what is actually the morale uh, on the Russian side? Because you get all kinds of things, and I don't even know what to believe at this point. But that is the, that's the summary for uh, this, this, vlog, this week's uh, Ukrainian battlefield report. Uh, again, prayers to all the guys on the front lines, and uh, you know, it, I, 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 just like everybody else, I wish this would come to the end. But uh, but go guys, go go guys, go. All right, we are back for the third thing, uh, and this is Jonathan Roy. Uh, Jonathan Roy is an expat here in Warsaw, Poland, and I know, I know, this is uh, a lot of times I have politicians. Uh, military guys, um, and you're going, okay, well, he's an expat, so what? You're an expat. There's lots of expats, but you know what? Um, this is relevant, and he's relevant. Well, I think you're just a relevant guy anyway. Maybe, but... I'm, a, maybe, I'm, a, maybe, I'm, a, maybe I'm a secret company. Yeah, well, anyway, all right. Well, anyway, so Jonathan, I'm glad you're here uh, for the third thing. And, and the topic is, and so nobody turn us off when I say this, the topic is COVID. Now, it's not exactly what you think. Uh, in, but when, the reason I'm talking COVID is because in the news, in the news in the U.S., 
They're again talking about COVID. They're talking about masks. They're talking about everything. And Jonathan was one of these guys, like many of us who are here in Europe, on the front line. And, uh, you know, your business was hit. Your yeah. business was hit. But before we get into that, just tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, what 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 you you know your 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 sojourn in Poland and what it looked like. For sure. And 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 to start, I gotta apologize for. All right. Bringing the COVID to Poland. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, sorry. What? Oh, you're, you you're you're like yeah, yeah. you're the sorry for starting. All, you're I'm, the guy that I'm sorry for COVID causing all that COVID. <laughs> I might have actually. Okay. But that's right. a whole different story. All but, right. uh, well, anyways, yeah. So, so get... I'm an, an American. I'm more a New Yorker than an American, I All always right. say. Uh, I moved here. My wife is Polish, but she left here when she was very young yeah. and four years old. So she never really lived here. She grew up in Taiwan and right. Australia. All right. And we met in New York. We've been married 15 years, blah, blah, blah. She has a passport here. We came here. Yeah, because we wanted to do the Europe thing. You know? All right, and uh, this was a great home base. And her father was sick and still is, and so we we we're here for that too. Mm -hmm. um, and we're like, we've been visiting for a long time, every right? Year, and uh, we're like, and I'm a, I'm an architect, designer, painter, what have you. Uh, but I've I did a lot of club and restaurant and hotel stuff in New York City. Right. So we're like, okay, let's do a restaurant here. This place is ripe for it let's, right. let's let's do it it's a it's a small pond let's come in here and, and do something great right and, and and we did and it took about three years for that great thing to be great because people didn't really understand how to deal with it uh, right is it a bar is it a restaurant is it fancy is it not you know well i mean but it always takes yeah, yeah, yeah. it does take time well, for anything but where to we catch come on, from but yeah. where we come from in new york the challenge is to maintain your oh, right. So you have the big the opening and then yeah, you keep, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you hope that no one leaves, right? Right, right, right. Or, and, and here it's kind of like the rest of the world where you have to, you know, build sort of it convince and stuff like people that. Yeah, to yeah, slowly yeah. show up. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and it was hard a little bit because I think like we looked fancy, but we were trying to be very chill and, and, and were very relaxed and we greet people with a smiling face and everything right. but i think a lot of uh polish people were felt intimidated or a little bit insecure they about sure it to think about it's it like, anyway. well this looks like a club where everyone's having fun yeah and i don't mean like a club like a nightclub but like a, a club like people you, knew each other like yeah 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 like but we're like yes come in we we were inviting you also right, right right and it's like a little bit wary you know right so we we misread that a little bit and then right. eventually boom uh three years in fantastic every day of every week was better than the last one in terms right. of numbers. And we're like rocking it and then COVID. Boom. Right. So uh that's it. And then we we um we we did the first lockdown and then it opened up again fifty percent. Right. Doesn't mean anything because yeah, like I need even... I need hundred and fifty percent to make the bills, right? Right. Uh and then the second lockdown happened and then we just said, okay, we're not doing this that's anymore. It. It's like we're getting out because I can't pay rent for, I knew it was going to be six months. And yeah. it was the next yeah, lockdown. Yeah. I was like, I can't pay the rent when I can't legally make money. Right, 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 right. And no one's giving me a break. And the government didn't, we tried to apply for all that shit, nothing. But some, but uh, some, but definitely yeah. some restaurants or some of the clubs, yeah. they did. And then maybe they had to, yeah. because uh, if, if it's a, it was a city owned building that you have a property in, they, they said you don't have to pay rent, right? Ah, right. So there was that. There's a lot of things that, I don't, I mean, we can, I mean, this is the point of what we're talking about. Yeah. We'll get into it more, 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 more thoroughly probably. But like, um, but yeah, so we just said, okay, we can't anymore. Right. And that was it. It's like, we're not, yeah. And it, it's like, you know what? Okay. So I lost what? Half a million dollars right. of investment. And, and then, several years and then of your had, life and just over that. And then lots of debt still. I still have debt from that. Right. I still get called by like and, people. And so, well, t well, tell me this. I mean, uh. I, I, I don't know what your take is on COVID. I can tell you that I'm on the, you know, uh, I got, I unfortunately caught to COVID four times, almost killed me the third time, wound up in the hospital. I'm definitely not a denier. No, nor am I. Uh, uh, and I, when I was joking about bringing it here, I, I came back from Australia and Bangkok in January, end of January, 2020. Right. And the moment I got off the airplane, yeah, I was shivering and I spent a week in bed. <laughs> and different than uh, a normal flu thing where you go hot, cold, right, right. Blah, blah, blah. I was just cold the whole time. Right. 
And so AK. maybe you were. Like, you were the guy that brought it I think, to, I, you, I, I think that was, this is Jack. You guys didn't expect this to be. <laughs> this is investigative journalism at its finest. I think we I track had it. down. Uh, patient zero. <laughs> patient zero. <laughs> patient zero in Straight Poland. Straight from Bangkok. Yeah. yeah. Patient zero in Poland. And then you, you went, but, and so, but you didn't. In, For one week, I was just like miserable, but not that miserable. But you it, didn't have the lungs. In no, no, no. Yeah, but yeah. many people don't. I mean, yeah, true. Uh, and I just was like, what for me was strange was that I was just cold and not hot and cold. Right, right, right. Which is a, a typical fever yeah, yeah. slash flu thing. Yeah, yeah. I was just like cold. And and then one week later, done. But then... But and we didn't know about this yet, right? Right. Like, That's it was true. Like, Nobody knew. They just, this is the end like, of January. Right. And so, well, tell me this, though. Then okay. uh, when, this decision to just, just to stop it. Now, looking back, right, let's say that... Uh, I don't think this is going to happen. I don't think this government or hardly any European government is going to say. Like these days. Yeah, they're not going to do. They're not going to shut everything I mean, down like, again. They were, they were but, letting but let's go, say go on hell at the, you well, know, in the yeah. middle of. <laughs> but, but, but let's say let's say that that uh, you were in considering what you went through and yeah. the fact that you had to shut down. And I guess theoretically, there's always the risk that you know they talk about pandemics. They can come out whatever. Would you do it again? Do what again? Start a restaurant like that and go take that risk again? Um, I'm going to start one again, but it's not going to be the same. That'll be like stage three will be the restaurant we had before. Right. Right now, I want to do a sklep. I want to do a store that has our products in it. Right. A cafe. So something, it's closed it, at 10 at night. We're not doing the late night. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, uh, brunches on the weekends because people like our brunches. Yeah. Uh, but uh, something manageable. But you see you see my point, though. I but mean, I know, yeah. What, going down that road again, if, you know, has it created the type no, of... But what else am I going to do? What And what can you do? Right. So every business is going to be... Right. I, I know, like, wait, okay. <sighs> Are they going to close us down? I don't know. I don't think they will. I don't think so. I'm just saying that once you've been through it yeah. and you've had the shut down and you've been burned like that, yeah, whether yeah. you can say it's, you know, God's fault if we want... Uh, you, does does that put you off as an entrepreneur to take that risk again, or do no, you say no? No, no, I no. don't think so. Because you got to keep, you got to keep it. trying. You got to right? do it, right? You got to keep trying. You got to, and and we're specifically like we we pivoted because of the pandemic to a, more of a grocery kind of situation with our food. And you know what? I'm not a I'm not a grocer, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. But I've been doing that for two years. Right. And it's not working. The e-commerce thing doesn't work. It's all this stuff. And you can read all this. You're, you're about a, your VC. So we want to do an actual, yeah. we're going, we want to go back to a, a brick and mortar thing where we can be the ambassadors and create our community again and you, nurture that. You know, that's and a so really... that's a very important thing. It's like, so we can, we'll, we'll withstand that. We can, we can withstand a close out, a, a close down again. Yeah, but, yeah. Because... A, we're not going to hopefully be paying as much rent as we were, and we're going to not we're not going to be suckers. Well, we've well, learned a lot. We've learned a lot. Well, you made you you said something. This is why I wanted you on here because you know we in and I'm sure that all the people watching, you know, you read the news, you read the business news, you read, you know, it's always this perspective from the big players or the people that have the the the, the investment or the private equity yeah. or whatever, right? They don't but you made a. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I didn't say that. But you made a great point, and and I'll I'll tell you why in a second. But you said the the e commerce doesn't work. Doesn't work. Everyone okay. tells you it works. Why? It Lately, work. I want to I want to go down that road because this is a this is I've got a a, a, a similar a remarkably similar perspective on that. Why doesn't it work? Okay, you need a sh for someone a like lot you. of a lot of money to yeah. promote market and get people to know you exist. Right. Okay. And then because they can't just walk by you on the street. You're just out no, there in the no. Yeah, yeah. So so okay. So oh it's wonderfully scalable because we can just it's just the yeah, everybody. Yeah. We can get everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. No. Um you gotta find them. They have to like take the chance on your product, which for right. us is a little bit different than regular Polish products. Yeah, so yeah. for us it's difficult. We're not selling socks. We're not selling tomato sauce. We're selling something that's a little bit different, you know, right. barbecue sauce and right. uh, you know, American uh, yeah. type that, and that, that whole angle, you know, yeah. like like uh, honey right. mustard mayo. I mean, yeah, yeah. like if you can't taste it, are you going to take a chance on it? But that's if they even know you exist, right? Um, and then because of the delivery and courier situation in this country, and it's not 
so different here than other ones adjacent to us in different countries. Yeah. But like, I can't deliver on, and we're not doing Uber, you know, it's not right. a meal. So it's, you get it the next day, right? and you get it through DPD if it's cold, and you get it through InPost if it's not cold, and then you hope they don't break it and screw everything up, and right, often right. they do. Right. So we're right. losing customers, we're pissing people off right. because the couriers don't work. So that's e-commerce. Like, so all these people that are doing all this successful e-commerce with the meal kits and yeah, all these yeah, kind yeah. of fitness things and all that stuff, I think it's a bunch of false numbers. Because okay. we, we were like, oh, we were doing all this stuff when we were pitching to get investors to, yeah, for our yeah. subscription model and all this stuff. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's 700 companies in Poland that are doing 10,000 subscribers a month. And right. oh, this is all the stuff you read when you actually look at the, sure. at the, at the business uh, well, uh, it, publications it's, and it's stuff funny. like that. But I think it's a bunch of, it's a horseshoe. I mean, how, I mean, how are they delivering this? Right. All right. Well, the, the funny 8, thing is 8,000 people said, every day, like at six in the morning at, for 400 places, it's impossible. I don't right, know. Right. So, and then there's this, okay. There's this thing called Delhi 2. Yeah. They were one of the big, we're going to have all these products. Da, 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 right. da. We've teamed up with Ad, uh, Adam Gessler. Blah, blah, right. Blah, blah, blah. Don't get me sued now. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, all right. They, they, are now in their newest round of getting money again after three years. And they right. have a, it's a tower or something, it's a VC company. They put yeah. it, they own 60%. These people did a Kickstarter two years ago because they didn't have enough money and they didn't even make their, they didn't make their thing in Kickstarter. And they said that at the beginning they were making 10,000 a month. Right. Zwati, 10,000 a month. Well, that, yeah. and that's, and, that, and then in December they made 100,000. Uh, and so this is, and they have thirty prod, they have thirty different purveyors of products. Sure, sure, sure. It just it's it, very it doesn't work. Like, how do you deliver this stuff? You can't. And how many people? And how do you make that work? So, so sorry, it's just, from the where, numbers just don't work. From where you're sitting, basically, it's only like the Amazons, the you know, the monster players that can make this kind of thing work. Then yeah, but I don't think they could. Eat, I don't think even they could do it with well, food. You know, you know what's very interesting. Yeah, food is is doing that. But you know what's interesting is that or even uh, if you take a look at at what at the mom and pops, the the internet stores that that you know were all over Poland prior to COVID, a lot of them were having a really tough time prior. To, and then COVID hit, and the word was okay. Everyone who's doing anything e-commerce, they now they've made it because uh, everyone so, thought everyone's yeah, going to be sitting like, at home yeah. and everybody. But uh, that doesn't seem to have played out. That it's doesn't not. seem to play. It out. hasn't happened. I was just reading it, an article today from in the Atlantic. They're yeah. talking about how everyone got retail wrong, and they they use this whole. It's a feature about the Bass Pro Shops. You know those, right? right? Yeah, sure. And how they took Bass over. Bass the, They're talking about the, fishing shops. The pyramid. Home. The pyramid in Memphis. You know yeah. that that. And they've taken over. It's five hundred thousand square feet, and they've made this Disneyland park there. And then, they, and the article is all, back to bricks and all about how people want a, an experience. People want still want to go want to into go a somewhere. space. Yeah, yeah. Even if it's about buying really high end hiking and, and camping sure, equipment, sure, right? Sure. And sure. guns or whatever. Well, you know, but I like, mean, there's some to it because you want to try it on. Like, uh, yes, people yeah. want to try it on. Do, do you know, um, I've got, because uh, I'm into boxing, so I order, you know, boxing, you know, boxing gloves, boxing shoes, and to tell you the truth. I'm a Thai boxer, well, not a boxer. Well, somebody like me, you do the I professional hate. boxing thing, right? No, uh, no I'm not a professional. No, 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 that 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 thing, the professionals boxing. Oh, like I a, did do the white collar yeah, boxing. Yeah, yeah. I did With do the white collar boxing. And everything. Yeah, 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 I did. I was I was I twice the age of the guy I fought. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, he, he threw like one zillion punches. To tell you the truth, I'm like, dude, man, I'm I'm fifty. At the time, I was fifty three. I think he was like twenty five. He threw like a zillion. Ah, you look forty two. I look forty two. <laughs> well, I'm not fifty three now. I'm older than that. But it, the thing about uh, if you want to do like to do things whether it's boxing gloves or whether it's fishing gear whether it's things that maybe it's a guy thing i don't want i, I need to try it on yeah and but see i think women feel I, the same way i mean yeah, they do no, a lot women, of this but, sort of but i'm women getting get it and they're always they very disappointed back, they get it they yeah, yeah, send it yeah, yeah, back. exactly i yeah. don't want to send it back i don't want to go back pack it and go back to the store especially not here it's a pain in, yeah, well it's, sure. i think it's in, in a pain anywhere i mean it's yeah. not what it's just not what i want to do and like things like say guitars i don't want to buy it i don't want to buy a guitar order it and then get it delivered to me. And, and then has, set it up. And only and then, has four strings. And well, no, I mean, <laughs> but then you got to set this it up. This is the base. Send it back. No, it's there. There's a lot of you know that kind of reality of the, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of it was sort of dissipated, I guess, because of COVID, or it was on that way prior to COVID of the bricks and mortar. Um, but maybe it's going to come back. Maybe it's going to come back. That's what I, you're banking I, I on, though, so. right? Well, yeah, but I also, I don't have to bank on just that. Yeah. 
we walk out the street, there's grocery stores, right? Sure. There's bookstores. Sure. There's homeware stores. Well, sure. in the malls. Yeah. We want to put all that together, right? Right. So it's not it's not exactly a a risky proposition. Right. No, right? it is proven. Yeah, it is proven. <laughs> like there's From, you can buy groceries everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. we're gonna do it well and right and show people what they're messing up here. Because we go to breakfast, we go to places, we're always exploring. Right. And right. Then if it's a bad experience, we're like well, we've, we've learned something. You should do. We always see it as a positive. Oh man, I should. I guess everything I should is get like you, everything I should is like get you doing the restaurant. Eighty percent, seventy percent. It's never. It's like this could be great, but they just they're, they're I, moving, I, they're moving I, tables behind me while I'm ordering my dinner. What the, I, I should get you. Do, <laughs> I should get you do the restaurant review. Except you'd be conflicted though. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you're listen, a little conflicted. I mean, no, it would be. I mean, I mean, yeah. You got to get Alex Weber in there. All right. Well, to actually, I think now then I don't think he's going to do it. I don't think he's, you know, because everything Weber writes for a different publication. I know I don't that think and everything is positive. That, yeah. So if you need to give him a chance to actually be honest and sometimes this negative, guy's just going to get me this. sued. Yeah. So this is what happened. Yeah, Alex, don't you You're sue me gonna, either. No, he's dead. <laughs> he, he doesn't exist. All right. You don't look. want the Russians to come find him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. Hey, look, I appreciate it. Is that it? It's been great. That's it. That's it. Thanks a lot. Look. Guys, uh, oh, one thing though, I featured him already, uh, his writing in uh, the corners for the short on story Friday, contest. Right? Yeah. yeah, on a Friday. And um, the short story contest is still on. I still want your submissions, but I want short stories or excerpts of a novel. Don't send me the whole novel. Don't do it. Don't <laughs> send me the whole novel. Uh, but that is still on. And I Just really say like, a one pager. One pager. A one pager would be great. But I really I liked you. your stuff. I'll probably get more. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. Thank I'm looking you. forward to and it. I anyway. appreciate that you 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 saw that on the on the Facebook and you liked it and you, you no no it was got good. Me involved to it, so. No, it was good. No, I'm looking forward to more. And actually, uh, hit the corners. Check that out. You can find it on the website www.thecorners.pl. Um, and if you find Fiction Fridays, you can go back and uh, see a bit of what's coming. And I do have your submissions. I'm working through them, and it's actually not even just me, but the long submissions, we want short stories, short stories or excerpts, something like that. But all right. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Good Wonderful. luck with your new a endeavor. Pleasure. A pleasure. A pleasure. And uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, yeah. We'll be back, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> see you soon. If I'm chatty enough. I think. Oh, I think so. <laughs> see you guys.